Almighty God says, All the work done this day is so that man can be made clean and be changed through judgment and chastisement by the word, as well as through refinement, man can purge away his corruption and be made pure. Rather than deeming this stage of work to be that of salvation, it would be more apt to say it is the work of purification. In truth, this stage is that of conquest, as well as the second stage in the work of salvation. It is through judgment and chastisement by the word that man arrives at being gained by God. And it is through the use of the word to refine, judge, and disclose that all of the impurities, notions, motives, and individual aspirations within man's heart are completely revealed. It is not easy for man to become aware of his sins. He has no way of recognizing his own deeply rooted nature, and he must rely on judgment by the word in order to achieve this result. Only thus can man gradually be changed from this point onward. Amen. Amen. God's words show us his work of judgment and chastisement in the last days is to judge and refine us by means of his words, to resolve our corruptions and purify our dispositions. Personally, I have experience I'd like to share. Of course. Sure. I used to feel so jealous seeing brothers and sisters performing, singing in praise of God. I dreamed of the day I could sing and bear witness to God on stage. What an honor it would be. Turns out, that day came sooner than I thought. May 2018, I joined rehearsals for a choral show, The Kingdom Anthem. Well, I'd never sung or danced before, so practice was difficult for me at first. I was really nervous when I sang, and had a stiff look on my face, and I was always out of sync in the dances. But I didn't lose heart. I'd think of the Kingdom Anthem being testimony about God's coming, and feel so inspired that I would just keep praying. I would put my all into performing well. Amen. God guided me bit by bit, and soon I started to feel more comfortable with it all. I was even helping others with their expressions. I was pleased with myself and thought, now I'm performing great. My movements are really something. When they're filming, I'll be put in the very front for sure. And when the brothers and sisters back home see me in front, they'll be so excited and proud. I bet they'll even be jealous of me. Whenever I thought that, I just felt great with boundless energy for my duty. And when we practiced, even when I was tired and sore, I didn't relax. I was afraid that if I slacked off, I wouldn't be in front and wouldn't have a chance to show myself. I knew I had to do my best, no matter how hard it was. As filming approached, the director mapped out our positions on stage. I was so excited and looked for my name on the list. Then I saw I was in row seven. I couldn't believe it. Why was I put so far back? Did the director make a mistake? My movements and expressions all looked great. I had even been helping others with their movements. I really thought I should be farther up. Why was I all the way back? If I wasn't in a shot, if I never made it on screen, then nobody else would even see me. The thought left me really disgruntled. In rehearsals, I couldn't put my joy or energy into performing anymore. I always felt sullen, especially when I saw some of the sisters in the first few rows whose performance was nothing special. I didn't understand. How were they better than me? Why did they get to be in the front rows while I was stuck in back? I just felt so much jealousy and couldn't accept it. But I did see some brothers and sisters who were better in practice than me. They were put in farther back rows but in rehearsals, they looked perfectly happy, as if it didn't bother them at all. This puzzled me. Even in back, they were obedient and proactive. So why was it hard for me? Why couldn't I submit? Was I being unreasonable? I felt some self-reproach at that time, but I still didn't reflect on myself. 
I couldn't get over my place in the lineup. Then later, the director made some changes to the lineup. I was secretly excited and thought I'd move to the front this time. But when I saw it, I just wanted to cry. What happened? I was put in the very last row, on the edge, where the cameras would hardly see me. And what I thought was even worse, some sisters, who hadn't been there long, were put ahead of me. It felt like everything had been knocked off balance. I had been practicing so hard, practicing my movement so that I could end up in the film. So why was I put in an obscure back corner with no chance to show my face? I was merely a set piece. What was the point of even being in the show? If I'd known, I wouldn't have worked so hard in rehearsals. I felt like I was falling apart. I couldn't accept this. Turns out, in practice a few days later, I sprained my ankle. So I thought, now that my ankle's sprained, I can rest. No need to tire myself out. I'm in the back. No one can see me anyway. Why work so hard? I'd get there late and leave early. When rehearsals got tough, I'd rest in the wings. A few other sisters started to remind me seeing this. It's almost filming day. If you don't practice with us, you'll be out of sync with everybody else. We can't drag our feet. That's, That's right. right. This was upsetting, and I did start to feel a little bad. I knew we were filming in just 20 days. If I didn't get busy rehearsing, the whole project could be delayed. I could cause a disturbance. I suddenly felt afraid. Why had I been acting so depraved? Upon reflecting, I started to see I had lost drive for my duty and became resistant since they had put me in the back row and I couldn't show off. I was just doing the bare minimum. The whole time I was resisting God. My sprain was getting worse and worse, which could have been God disciplining me. If I kept being resistant, showing off aside, I might not even get up on stage and I'd lose my duty. In my pain and self-reproach, I prayed to God that night. Oh God, I had just been really upset ever since I was put in the back row. I wasn't submitting, had complaints. I'd been doing my duty poorly, slacking on the job. I have seen how rebellious I am. I've disappointed you. Please, God, lead me out of this awful state. Then I read these words of God. As soon as it touches upon position, face, or reputation, everyone's heart leaps in anticipation, and each of you always wants to stand out, be famous, and be recognized. Everyone is unwilling to yield, always instead wishing to contend, even though contending is embarrassing and not allowed in God's house. However, without contention, you are still not content. When you see someone stand out, you feel jealous, hatred, and that it is unfair. Why can't I stand out? Why is it always that person who gets to stand out and it's never my turn? You then feel some resentment. You try to repress it, but you cannot. You pray to God and feel better for a while. But as soon as you encounter this sort of situation again, you cannot overcome it. Does this not display an immature stature? Is not a person's falling into such states a trap? These are the shackles of Satan's corrupt nature that bind humans. If a person has cast off these corrupt dispositions, is he not then free and liberated? Consider this, what sorts of changes must a person make if he wants to refrain from becoming ensnared in these conditions, be able to extricate himself from them, and become liberated from the vexations and bondage of these things? What must a person obtain before he is truly able to be free and liberated? On the one hand, he must see through things. Fame and fortune in positions are but tools and methods that Satan uses to corrupt people, to entrap them, to harm them, and to cause their depravity. In theory, you must first gain a clear understanding of this. Furthermore, you must learn to let go of these things and set them aside. Otherwise, the more you struggle, the more darkness will surround you, and the more jealousy and hatred you will feel, and your desire to obtain will only grow stronger. The stronger your desire to obtain, the less capable you will be to do so, and as you obtain less, your hatred will increase. As your hatred increases, you will grow darker inside. The darker you are inside, the more poorly you will perform your duty, 
The more poorly you perform your duty, the less useful you will be. This is an interlinked, vicious cycle. You cannot perform your duty well in such a state, so gradually, you will be eliminated. Amen. Amen. These words awakened me a little bit. God's words revealed my own state precisely. After I joined the choir group and became more familiar with the dance routines, even leading others in their practice, I felt like I performed better than them and would be in the front when they filmed it. I was filled with energy for my duty, thinking I'd show off on camera. I was happy to work hard, and I focused on practicing. But when my position was in a faraway row in the back, my hopes of showing off were ruined. I resisted the director's arrangement and refused to accept those in front. I was jealous. I complained about it. I felt it wasn't fair. I tried to reason with God. I became negative and slacked off. I even regretted all the work I'd put in before. As I reflected on my behavior and motives, I realized I wasn't doing my duty in consideration of God's will or bearing witness to Him. I just wanted the opportunity to stand out and have others admire me. Wasn't I merely fighting for my own status and reputation? I was so selfish and despicable. God was elevating me by giving me a chance to join the choir, but devoid of all conscience, I did not think of how I could satisfy God. All I did was try to show off, and when I couldn't, I got upset and complained. I fell into a really dark state. This way, I did a bad job, and this disgusted God. Wasn't I falling into Satan's trap? I thought about all those who worked hard behind the scenes, who didn't get to go on stage, but worked hard without complaint, who jumped right into their duties with both feet. Compared to these people, I was nobody. It felt like I didn't know good from bad and was indebted to God. I didn't want to be this rebellious. I wanted to repent. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to Amen. God. After that, I read these words from God. You must learn to let go and set aside these things, to recommend others, and to allow them to stand out. Do not struggle or rush to take advantage the moment you encounter an opportunity to stand out or obtain glory. You must learn to back off, but must not delay the performing of your duty. Be a person who works in quiet obscurity and who does not show off to others while performing your duty. The more you let go and set aside, the more peaceful you will become and the more space will open up within your heart and the more your state will improve. The more you struggle and compete, the darker your state will be. If you do not believe it, try it and see. If you want to turn this sort of state around and not be controlled by these things, then you must first set them aside and give them up. Amen. Amen. God's words gave me a way to go. When I wanted to show off, I would pray to God and forsake myself, let go of my own desires, and think about how I could do my duty as God required, get my movements right and sing well. That's what I should do. Thanks be to God. I realized my chance to be in the kingdom anthem was a creature's duty no matter where I was standing. God doesn't judge our devotion based on which row we stand in to sing, but on our sincerity and whether we practice truth and submit to God. Amen. 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 I felt much more at peace when I understood God's will. And then I prayed, God, I won't rebel again. Anywhere I stand, even if it's in the far back where I'm not seen, all I want is to do my duty well. Thanks be Amen. to God. Amen. After that in rehearsals, I was always put in the back. And sometimes I did think about how I'd never appear in a shot and no one would admire me. And I'd feel disappointed. When that happened, I prayed to God for quieting my heart. And I thought, how can I express what God requires with every single line that I sing? How could I always dance well with energy like I should? When I gave it my all in this way, I felt so close to God and didn't care where I was standing. Thanks be to God. As it turns out, closer to the filming day, I kept getting shifted toward the front row and was given some small scenes to shoot as well. I thanked God for giving me the opportunity. Those few days when we shot the scenes, I held on to my gratitude. With every take, I focused on putting my heart into it so I wouldn't have any regrets. Amen. Amen. 
For the very last take of filming, I was put in the front row, close to the camera. I simply couldn't believe it. I felt it was such a huge honor. I thanked God so much. I was determined to do a good job. As I happily walked to the first row, all the cameras were pointed right at me. The lights were on me. A sister rushed over to straighten my clothing and fix my hair. Suddenly, I felt like everyone was looking at me, like I was the center of attention. And I couldn't contain my excitement. I never expected to be in the first row. If the shot turned out well, I thought many people would see me. And I'd really make a name for myself. The idea was growing on me. It felt really good. And then I realized that I wasn't in the right state, wanting to show off again. I started to pray to God, forsake myself. But I couldn't stop thinking in this incorrect way, and I couldn't calm down. We did a few takes, but I couldn't do well. The director reminded us to get into the right state of mind. I got nervous then that the director would see I was off and put me in the back row. I'd lose my opportunity to show off. But I realized I couldn't think of my own interest and I should adjust my state and do my duty well. All this time, I felt this battle raging inside between wanting to show off and wanting to do my duty well. I felt incredibly nervous. We did take after take, but I couldn't get into it and I looked really stiff. Then I saw some of the other sisters talking about what they'd learned after the shoot and even moved to tears. But I couldn't get my spirits up. I felt so dejected and quietly left as quick as I could. Walking back, I felt so guilty about having done a bad job when the cameras were on me. Everybody else had given God their innocent smiles their honest hearts, while all I'd given was my obsession with showing off, and my performance wasn't good enough to bear witness to God, and God couldn't approve of my duty. Then, I just really wanted to cry. I said to God, God, with this last shoot, I have regrets. I no longer want to show off. I want to be at the far back of the stage, in a corner where no one, not even the camera, can see me. As long as I have a simple, honest heart to genuinely sing for you, I'll be happy, I'll feel at peace, and I'll never feel accused again. But it's too late. I can't make up for what I've done. I felt worse the more I thought, feeling nothing but regret and how I'd done my job. I quieted my heart and tried to think it over. Why was my desire to stand out and to show off so strong that forsaking the flesh and practicing the truth became so hard? I read this in God's words. What you like, what you focus on, what you worship, what you envy, and what you think about in your heart every day are all representative of your nature. It is enough to prove that your nature is fond of unrighteousness. And in serious situations, your nature is evil and incurable. You should analyze your nature in this way. That is, examine what you are fond of and what you forsake in your life. Perhaps you are good to someone for a while, but this doesn't prove you like him or her. What you are truly fond of is precisely what is in your nature. Even if your bones were broken, you would still enjoy it and could never forsake it. This is not easy to change. In addition to uncovering the things people are fond of in their natures, other aspects pertaining to their natures also need to be uncovered. For example, people's viewpoints on things, people's methods and goals in life, people's life values and views on life, as well as views on all things relating to truth. These are all the things deep within people's souls and they have a direct relationship with the transformation of disposition. Amen. Amen. God's words helped me understand that human thinking, preferences and pursuits all come from our nature and are controlled by our nature. Right. So I asked myself, what had I been seeking 
that entire time in my duty. When my place on the stage kept getting pushed toward the front, and I was in more and more shots, I mostly thought about the chance to finally be in front, to gain others' envy, and to show off. Especially in the last scene, when I was put in the front row. I felt like I was some kind of star. I thought I'd done a good job. So much so that I couldn't control my desire to show off. Or show my best face for the camera. To let those watching who knew me see me and give myself a wonderful memory. I saw how much I treasured name and that it had burrowed into my heart, becoming my nature. Afterward, I read this in God's words. A corrupt satanic disposition is very deeply rooted in people. It becomes their life. What exactly do people seek and wish to gain? Under the driving force of a corrupt satanic disposition, what are people's ideals, hopes, ambitions, and life goals and directions? Do they not run contrary to positive things? Firstly, people always want to have renown or be celebrities. They wish to gain great fame and prestige and to bring honor to their ancestors. Are these positive things? These are not at all in line with positive things. Moreover, they run counter to the law of God's having dominion over the fate of mankind. Why would I say that? What kind of person does God want? Does He want a person of greatness, a celebrity, a noble person, or a world-shaking person? No. So then, what kind of person does God want? He wants a person with their feet firmly on the ground who seeks to be a qualified creature of God, who can fulfill the duty of a creature, and who can keep to a human's place. You are always seeking greatness, nobility, and dignity. You always seek exaltation. How does God feel when He sees this? He loathes it and does not want to look upon it. The more you pursue things like greatness, nobility, and being superior to others, distinguished, outstanding, and noteworthy, the more disgusting God finds you. Do not be someone whom God finds disgusting. So how can this be achieved? By doing things in a down-to-earth way while standing in man's position. Do not entertain idle dreams. Do not seek fame or to stand out from your peers. And moreover, do not try to be a person of greatness who surpasses all others, who is superior among men and makes others worship them. That is the path Satan walks. God does not want such created beings. If, in the end, once all of God's work is done, there are still people who pursue these things, then there is only one outcome for them, to be eliminated. Amen. Amen. God's words were like a wake-up call. I wondered why I always liked to act so vain and to show off. It was all because I was corrupted by Satan. The ideas of, go out and make a name for yourself, and success is the only thing worth working for had seeped into me, giving me the wrong outlook on life. I thought seeking reputation and status was a positive thing. I made them goals for my life. I wanted to show off no matter what I was doing, so that other people would look up to me and envy me. I felt that living that way was better and honorable. That love for reputation and status had become my very nature. I thought about how I'd always wanted to excel before, in school or interactions with others. I wanted to be ahead of others, to be in the limelight. When others took notice of me, I would feel happy. But when I went unnoticed, in a group of people, I couldn't stand it. I wanted to fight for a place, and was sad whenever I failed. I was always living by these satanic poisons and wanted others to look up to me. These thoughts were like shackles, binding me and controlling my thoughts. They made me think of this movie, which was supposed to bear witness to God, more as my own personal stage. My duty became like a springboard to satisfy my own wants. All my heart felt was the desire to stand out. I didn't think of satisfying God or doing my duty. I saw that if I didn't change my satanic nature, not only could I not do my duty well, but worse, I'd be eliminated by God because I'd resisted Him. Later, I read these in God's words. What God requires of people is not the ability to complete a certain number of tasks or accomplish any great undertakings, nor does He need them to pioneer any great undertakings. What God wants is for people to be able to do all they can in a down-to-earth way and live in accordance with His words. 
God does not need you to be great or honorable, nor does He need you to bring about any miracles, nor does He want to see any pleasant surprises in you. He does not need such things. All God needs is for you to listen to His words, and once you have heard them, to take them to heart and heed them as you practice in a down-to-earth manner, so that God's words may become what you live out and become your life. Thus God will be satisfied. Amen. Amen. I saw that God's will for us is to be totally honest people and to pursue the truth, to work hard on our duties, and to submit to His rule and arrangements. Working toward these goals will satisfy Him. I didn't know God's will before, just pursued my reputation. Therefore, I couldn't do my duty, which disappointed God. I was so corrupt, but God didn't give up on me. Each time, He revealed my wrong pursuit by adjusting where I stood on stage. Then I could see my satanic disposition, course correct, and change. God's love was really moving. I said this prayer to Him, God, I don't want to be envied anymore or stand out. Those pursuits only bring me pain and make me unable to satisfy you in my duty, making me feel guilty. From now on, I'll practice according to your words, no matter what position I have, no matter if I can show off. All I want is to sing in praise of you with a heart of submission and satisfy you with my duty. Amen. After that, when we redid scenes, sometimes I was moved back, sometimes forward. Sometimes I was used in practice, but wasn't needed when they filmed it again. It did affect me emotionally. But by reading God's words and praying, I was able to let go of my own desires. Sometimes I'd see other sisters bothered when their place changed on stage, who weren't doing their duty well. I was able to find some relevant words of God, share my own experiences, and help them out. Doing my duty in that way felt meaningful. It felt great. Of course. Later, the director put me in the front row again. But unlike before, I wasn't showing off. I felt like being in a shot was a responsibility, a testimony. I focused on singing well and doing my duty. Amen. I remember one scene. I was in the far back. We sang, Raise your triumphant banner to celebrate God. Sing your triumphant song of victory to spread God's holy name. I thought about how corrupted I'd become, seeking fame and status, how I'd failed to do my duty well or satisfy God. That day, I felt I should praise God from my heart and offer my best song to Him. Amen. Amen. So Satan would be defeated. That's right. That's right. When I sang in praise of God on that stage with this new way of thinking, I felt a kind of happiness I had never experienced before. I also felt such justice and pride. The Kingdom Anthem, this big choral project, was soon up online. We brothers and sisters were so excited to watch the video. And we saw so many of God's chosen people singing before the Mount of Olives. The multitudes cheer God. The multitudes praise God. It moved me like nothing else before had. I couldn't help but shed my tears of gratitude. Thanks be to God. Thinking over everything that happened, from being so bothered by my place on stage that I couldn't do my duty well, to later being unaffected by reputation and status, no matter where I was on the stage, but just freely singing with my heart and bearing witness to God. It was all because of God's work in me. Thanks Amen. be to God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.